Good morning. I'm Julio Sainz, along with Mauricio Riveros. Today, we'll be joined by Jill Natal, who has recently started her own HR recruitment and consulting firm. We hope you will be inspired. Celebrating leaders in Rochester's unique and vibrant business community, we'll meet entrepreneurs whose passion and perseverance have helped push through life's challenges. Join us as we share their stories and journeys to success. It's time to be inspired. Hi, Jill. Thank you very much for being, being inspired, a show that we have developed for our community to learn to interview people like you. Uh, so tell us who is Jim. Jill, sorry. That's okay. My husband's name is Jim. So I was going to tell you who was Jim there in short just a minute. So it worked out perfectly. Um, so my name is Jill Niddle. Thank you so much for having me. I own and founded a company called JK Executive Strategies here in Rochester about three years ago. So I've been in the field of staffing, searching, recruiting, that kind of thing for over 20 years and have made my life here in Rochester and have really, really just loved the community and loved Rochester as a whole. So that's really a little bit about me. I'm from originally from Pennsylvania, uh, came to Rochester to play basketball, believe it or not, at St. John Fisher College a long, long time ago <laughs> and stayed. Well, that's a wonderful story, Jill. Uh, one of the things that we love of when we interview people is talk a lot, a lot about, you know, the moment that you were able to get in your job, in the thing that you are doing right now. Uh, what was that, that decision and what happened at that point? When I decided that I wanted to start my company, you know, I, I've been, I have been in this field for a long time and over the years I've had partners and I got to the evolution, I think, inside that I wanted to be able to be different than, um, than others from an entrepreneurial perspective, as well as from a way that we provide services to our clients. So we're definitely different. We, uh, we work with our clients differently than a normal or a, any other staffing firm. We do a lot of executive search work, um, but launching into my own business Quite frankly, it took a lot of guts. I mean, you don't, you know, it's hard to quit a job without another job and say, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this on my own. So I think support of my husband and my family, um, and quite frankly, a lot of my clients that I had gotten to know to know over the years, um, who were, you know, super supportive and said, you have to do this. Fantastic. No, we, that's there's nothing like the entrepreneurial spirit and. You know, as an entrepreneur, a lot of times you know, we go from our gut and from our, our feelings. What are some of the common mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make in terms of hiring, especially once maybe they've hired everybody in the family and maybe then they need to go outside or, you <laughs> yeah. know, what yeah. are some of the common mistakes that you see? So I think, you know, it's interesting you ask that question because I've seen a lot of mishires over the years and oftentimes people come to us after they've mishired and said, oh gosh, you know, we need your help because we need to figure out how, how to make this right. Uh, I think a lot of it is people tend to hire uh, people that look and act and know the same stuff they do. So for lack of a better word, you know, if you're, if you're hiring your mirror image, you're probably not hiring the right person for the job because they're not going to provide diversity in thinking. They're not going to provide a lot of the, the stuff that will challenge you as a leader and make you expand and grow as a leader. So that's one of the, of the, of the mistakes I've seen. The other thing that I, I, I see a lot is that Companies and, and entrepreneurs, whether it's big companies or small companies, always feel like they have to hire fast because they have a need. You know, somebody gave their notice, somebody quit a job, they have to hire fast. And I always say, and I know that just doesn't sound right because I have a staffing company, but I always say hire slow, fire fast because hiring slow and making sure you actually know who you're hiring, you know, have you have you gotten to know the person? Have you gotten to know like have you had dinner, lunch, or 
a beer with them to be able to make sure that you like them as a person because you've interviewed them in the interview setting. So you know they have the skills, but do you like them as a person? And are you going to, what I say is, do you want them as part of your every day? And that is a wonderful element to really identify what is that right person, right? And 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 it's a discovery process. And and the reality is, you know, sometimes companies want want to do a lot of assessments and try to identify if this person is the right people, and they do this psychology analysis and all these things. What is your take about that? Because sometimes companies get into the extreme that they just want to put in boxes the people. And so, what's your recommendation around that? Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because I just spent the last four days, nine to five, including the weekends, getting another certification in an assessment tool. So, <laughs> uh, so I am certified in quite a few assessments, but here's where I differentiate with what I hear from others. I don't necessarily use it as a reason to hire or not to hire. I use it as informational purposes for the people who are hiring to be able to understand where the person's strengths are, where their weaknesses or blind spots might be, and how best to manage them or supervise them. When I place CEOs in positions, which we do a lot of executive level work as well as professional level, the CEOs, I work with boards of directors in being able to identify the CEO and the information that I walk them through that comes from their assessments, rarely ever do they say, oh, no, we don't want to hire that person now. It's just, oh, okay, so maybe in the first year we have to be aware that this is how they typically act. So from a leadership perspective, this is what we need to ask from them. So it's much more that information than it is yes or no. Now you touched earlier on, I, I really loved your answer to the previous question about uh, you know, hiring people that bring something different to the table. Um, if you're a small business owner watching this show and you want to add diversity to your staff, I know one of the good ways would be to, to hire your, your firm. Uh, what are maybe some other tips for trying to bring that diversity to the staff? I think listening to the rest of the team about what skill sets would be really, really great to have what ethnic backgrounds would be great to have uh, is all really, really like music to a leader's ears. Because sometimes when we're sitting in a CEO seat, we think we're supposed to have all the answers. And sitting around and actually hearing from your team, oh, I wish we had somebody that really knew social media or like in my team, we always, we always joke because we're all so social we really don't have anybody that is a complete role, rule follower and can dot all the I's and cross all the T's. So none of us pay attention to detail too well. So those type of skill sets and really being able to identify what we need in this role, role and then taking it the next step to actually dream a little. So what don't we know that we don't have? You know, what have we run across? What is our plan? What is our strategy over the next six months? And what skill sets are we going to need then? So really kind of thinking, I always say, you know, if you have somebody that gives notice, then it's time to take a look at their job description and see if that makes sense anymore for your company or your team or your group. Mm -hmm. That is very, very good, Jill, because I think one of the elements is, is engagement and how engaged are your employees? And one of the challenges is how you create that engagement. You know, right. there's a lot of tools people are talking about some rewards and recognition and all that. What's your take about that? Oh, I think engagement is by far one of the most important pieces that you can have in an employee culture. You know, one of our values in my company is we laugh. And it's so funny because, you know, one of our other values is we give back. So I, you know, I'm the, actually all of my team, we all volunteer on not-for-profit boards. We all, and I don't give, I don't have charged them, so to speak, any vacation to be able to donate their time. So I think that employee engagement and, and I'll take that a step 
further because it's employee engagement when they're in your office, but it's life engagement when they're out of your office. So being able to support, especially during these COVID times, how many of us have, you know, great, excellent workers that are now teachers at home three days a week because their kids are on a hybrid schedule. And, you know, it's a crazy world. And if you don't have engaged employees, and if you're not an engaged leader, you're going to lose really, really good people. Well, thank you so much, Joe. We'll be back with more after these messages. Going back to the smaller businesses, at what point is a company big enough to come to your organization for help? Yeah, good question. So to be honest with you, we've placed people that have, you know, less than, gosh, we just placed somebody at a startup. So I think there were six people. So a lot of times we do work with smaller companies because they don't have HR people. So from that perspective, they don't, they might not have a job description done, which we write job descriptions. They might not even have, I was working with a company today on them evolving their org chart and looking to see what skills they think they need going forward versus what skills they've had. So a lot of, um, a lot of those type of things happen at a very, very small company. So it doesn't really, it's, most companies come to us when they either don't have the bandwidth to be able or the expertise to be able to interview and do the searches themselves or so they don't they might not have the person inside or it's such a specific skill set that they need help in identifying particular candidates and real headhunting if you will from that perspective other smaller companies use us for human resources services. So we have a couple of people that go out to um, a company like one day a week, um, just so that there's employee relations type um, professionals there, which they might not have or might not be big enough. So Jill, a very important question in this situation with COVID, you know, and goes back to the element of what is happening, how the market is reacting. There is a lot of people who are very concerned, unemployment rate has been high, uh, big concerns of what's the future economy. What's your reading about this uh, new environment for people and, and working opportunities? So this is my third economic rodeo <laughs> in the staffing industry. And this is very, very different. So I will tell you that we did not see the significant downturn in this um, this time that we saw in 9/11 and 98. Um, the the biggest, um, I guess I should say, oh wait, um, the biggest challenge that we've seen is just it's slower to hire a little bit because executives and leaders have been busy <laughs> doing business planning and figuring out PPP calculations and all that kind of stuff that things like the hiring process is a little slower. Um, I do see that I think that there's a little bit of a difference in what the unemployment rate is versus people that are actually looking for work because I think that there's some folks that have decided to stay home with their kids um, to be able to school them or with the augmented um, unemployment. Um, people have used that to be able to spend more time with their families and things like that. How hard is it? Well, you're talking to two people, Mauricio and I, who love Rochester, so you don't have to convince us, but okay. what are some of the, what are, how challenging is it to, to attract talent to move to Rochester? Once I can sell Rochester and really talk about the, the wonderful community we have here. I, you know, I'm so active in not-for-profit boards and things like that. And being able to talk about the impact philanthropically that our community has on organizations, I think is, um, is really huge. And we have some really unbelievable companies here for the size of city that we are. So I think that is, is very attractive. Um, I also think that there's been a huge shift with people who are willing to relocate since COVID that who weren't before. So like, for instance, I just relocated um, an attorney from Stamford, Connecticut that decided, you know what? We don't wanna live in a big city anymore. 
we're going to take our kids and we're going to move to upstate New York and we're going to um, we're going to have a different life than we thought that we were going to have because of because they just don't want to be in that in the populated areas anymore. So I'm seeing that more. I'm also seeing companies be more flexible. So whether they have, you know, work from home or, you know, more flex time. Now we'll see how that evolves. But, um, you know, some people that accept positions, they're still working from home in new, new jobs and haven't necessarily gone into offices yet. Well, Jill, I, I just love the approach that you have in everything. It's very holistic. It's very creative. And you have a new way to put things. And I and really love it that... Um, now, there's a lot of people who are watching here and after COVID had maybe lost their jobs or lost their business. What would be the message for you from a motivation perspective? We want to be inspired, right? We want to inspire them. What would be the message? You have figured, you know, you have been able to fight, I'm sure, to develop your company and open doors and, and create and dream and all that. So what would be the message for people who are right now in depression and in difficulty? One of the biggest things that I love about Rochester is, is that people in Rochester give. They give to each other, they give of their time, they give of their energy and their expertise. Networking in Rochester is so easy. And asking folks for help, whether it's me or people that run networking groups or people that have just gone through a job search, that's very, very easy to do. And people are willing to help. I just saw actually the last two weeks, I've seen a significant amount of people get jobs that were looking during the COVID time. So the market is picking back up and has picked back up. Our office is very busy this week. Um, and I think that that's only gonna continue. I think asking for help is one of the hardest things that people can do, but asking for help is one of the best things that people can do when they're in a situation looking for a job. Now, um, is is LinkedIn really where people should be looking for jobs at this point? Is that the main place that you would advise? Yeah, so that's so funny you asked that because we live on LinkedIn. And um, the the what we can see on LinkedIn, so for those of you, so there's a lot of people that don't even realize there's a whole nother side to LinkedIn that people don't realize recruiters pay extra money for to be able to see. <laughs> And so if we're not necessarily connected, I can still see you if I'm in like the recruiters world of LinkedIn. And so it allows us to look for skills. It allows us to look for people. So yes, LinkedIn is very important, um, but also so is personal connections. So LinkedIn can be very, very overwhelming for a recruiter and LinkedIn does not interface at all with any of our softwares that we use for our own. So there's not necessarily a way to make sure that you don't lose messages on LinkedIn because they could go, like I could get a thousand a day, like on my birthday, it was so wonderful, but I'm connected to over 10,000 people. I don't really know where my my other messages went that weren't happy birthday on my birthday. So, so those are the kind of things you have to be aware of. But yes, LinkedIn is a key. Um, the one thing, though, that a lot of people don't know is Indeed is a free posting and LinkedIn is expensive. So that's why you see more positions and things like that on Indeed because it's they charge agencies to post, but they don't necessarily charge companies. And a lot of people don't necessarily know that difference. I see. For a quick follow-up question. Yeah. What do you think for, for our business owners, should they, post, should they look for people on Craigslist? You know, it depends on the job. Um, I think for general labor type folks and um, entry level type folks and things like that, I think it's um, I think it's an avenue. I don't think that it's the be all end all. So, like when we talk about um, positions that we have that come in, we talk about where best to post them. So, blue collar jobs, office type jobs, those type of things are LinkedIn. But I would also probably do it along with with um, with an Indeed or something like that, and if there is the spend available on on LinkedIn, I would definitely post um, you know more professional level positions and things like that on LinkedIn. Well, I love the advice and I love the knowledge. Uh, it's clearly an expert 
we will have here. So how do you see your organization in five years from now? So this is my, so the, uh, the sky's the limit. Um, I really have plans and a strategy to be able to grow nationally in certain verticals. So I just added um, a new member of our team in the beginning of July and people thought, oh my gosh, she's hiring in the middle of COVID. But I found this unbelievable team member that has strong experience doing higher ed and not-for-profit searches. And that's an area of growth that I see nationally. So I brought her on. So I'll continue um, to identify opportunity areas for my company and my team. And um, we'll just continue not to grow for the sake of growing, but to grow to be able to make an impact um, in people's lives, which is what, um, what we like to do every single day. Jill, we have learned so much tonight. Uh, thank you so much for being in Be Inspired. Really, you have inspired tonight uh, to us and, and to our audience. So I'm sure that in the future we'll be together again learning more about these HR aspects and most important relationships and connections and that's what it's about. So thank you again for being with us today. Next week we'll meet Adrian Hale from the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce and learn about their new workforce development initiatives. To watch today's episode and the complete interviews of our guests, go to rochesterfirst.com slash be inspired. For more great talk with Rochester's entrepreneurs, listen to Poder 97.1, Saturdays at 9 a.m. For Mauricio Riveros, I'm Julio Sainz. We'll see you next week on Be Inspired. <laughs>